Let's do it. All right, well, welcome everybody. We've got a number of guests today, but I wanna welcome you all to the, uh, let's see me, uh, Stephanie, make sure I get this right. This is our sixth subcommittee meeting for the acquisition workforce, subcommittee in the GSA Acquisition Policy Federal Advisory Committee, otherwise known as the GAP Pack. So we have a lot uh, for you today. And uh, before we get started, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna do a quick roll call here. I know a lot of our members are still coming in, but just to see who is here, I'm gonna go ahead and go through the list here. And uh, let's see, Gail, I don't see Gail yet. Uh, Daryl, I see you, I gotcha. Yeah. Nicole, I see you, I gotcha. Uh, don't see Mark yet. Uh, David. Don't see David, and I don't see Ann yet. Uh, Steve, I got you. Uh, Kristen, got you, and Clyde, I got you. Yep. Great, and then I know, as I said that, um, oh, I see Mark, Mark just came in. Hello, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Actually, afternoon for you. That's right, and, and Ann as well. Uh, so we have a, a, a full um, complement here today. Looking forward to the conversations. Um, again, Boris Aratia, the designated federal officer for the for this great committee. And uh, goodness, we're we're into a, uh, February here, moving moving right along. So I'm going to pass it over to our chair and co-chair. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Nicole, to sure, take us I from here. Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, welcome the committee, welcome our guests. I want to express my gratitude to our guest speakers um, that you're going to provide invaluable information to this committee today as we think about what's happening on the front lines of ESG or ESG. That's that's where my teaching space is right now. <laughs> and it's all related to sustainability. Yes. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, I just really want to thank you for coming and talking with us about what you see on those front lines. Our, our initial priority is to look at how we transition the federal acquisition workforce, especially around issues of level setting and developing core competencies around environment and sustainability. I also want to take a moment, Daryl, to thank you for getting us up on this committee off on solid ground. Uh, it is with much gratitude that I express the shoes, the big shoes I need to fill as we move on and advance the conversation. And I am taking you at your word that you're going to be working as part of the scaffolding to keep this committee moving forward. I'm very grateful for that. And also, I'd like to take a moment to uh, express my sincere thanks to Anne for jumping in and taking on the role of co-chair. Um, really looking forward to uh, the work that we're gonna do together. So thank you. With that, Boris, I'm gonna pass the baton back to you to introduce our guest speakers. And, and perhaps we should talk about the agenda first. Yeah. And see, I'm, that's what we should do. We'll we, do we've that. got a nice chunk of time to talk with our guest speakers. Um, about an hour and uh, 20 minutes. And, uh, and before we move on to a moment of public comments, and then we're gonna move into subcommittee reflections. This is a different, um, a different segment from our public meetings than what we've done previously, in part because we're thinking about creating more moments for this subcommittee after we hear from the terrific knowledge and wisdom of our guest speakers to reflect on what we just heard and ask how can this inform our recommendations. So we're gonna be pulling back our good friend, the Jamboard and doing some brainstorming there. So with that, Boris, let me ask you to introduce our guest speakers. Yeah, absolutely, thank you, Nicole. And uh, so what, what I wanted to do is uh, briefly, just a, a little history here. We've been talking in this subcommittee, how do we bring the voice of uh, the front line uh, GSA acquisition professionals to this conversation. And, and certainly that's what we're starting today. So without a whole lot of time, these great folks here that you see listed on the agenda, a volunteer and agreed to jump in and be a part of this conversation here. Um, and there may be a couple others that I may have missed somehow. If you're part of that acquisition workforce, uh, please feel free to join that conversation as well within GSA. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. So we have uh, John Hampson, 
Um, he's, um, and actually a number of these folks are coming to us from the Office of Travel, Transportation and Logistics, uh, GSA Fleet is a very solid group in the GSA Federal Acquisition Service. Uh, then we also have two uh, industrial operations analysts. Uh, we got Michael Cahill and Michael Wesley, uh, who spend a lot of time with our vendors. They work different regions. I'm really interested to hear their, in, their insights. Uh, we have Catherine Nelson, who is a contracting officer out of Region 10, not too far from where you are, and they're in uh, the Seattle area. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and, uh, and then we also have Zachary Shepard, who, who serves as a contract specialist, also in the Office of Travel, Transportation, and Logistics. Uh, again, if I missed any anyone here, feel free to jump in. And I'm going to um, go ahead. I'm actually going to stop sharing here. And yeah. I'm going to ask you to go ahead, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, go ahead and turn on your cameras, uh, those of you in the panel. And Likewise, for our members, um, we like to be very conversational here. This will be a really great opportunity to get to know you and the work that you do. So if you could please uh, turn on your cameras, that would be great. Uh, but I'm going to turn things over to Nicole to uh, get started with the conversation. Absolutely. So I'm going to pop into the chat the terrific questions that came from this um, subcommittee that we curated last week and honed in the over the weekend. Um, and I'm just going to kick it right off, uh, right off the top. So as you know, GSA is interested in embedding environmental and sustainability concerns into federal acquisition. So related to this subcommittee, the Federal Acquisition Workforce Committee subcommittee, we're thinking about different layers here. The workforce layers from senior managers to middle managers to front liners, the stages of the acquisition life cycle, and also external perspectives. So bringing in voices from OMB and EPA and others. So we can really begin to formulate a, a more complete picture of the issues that, that we're going to be providing recommendations for about how to transition this workforce. I mentioned that our first priority as a subcommittee is to identify the essential pathways needed to make environmental and sustainability concerns a core competency in federal acquisition. So we're really eager to learn your thoughts here on how GSA creates this sustainability mindset. And so the first set of questions that we're gonna be asking really focuses on this core competency issue to help level set across the organization. So to begin, could you, we wanna hear from you all, um, each of you. Can you briefly describe your role in federal acquisitions and how you incorporate sustainability activities into your acquisition practices today, if at all? And, and I, I wanna say, it could be that for some of these questions you don't know or you don't do it, knowledge of that information is, is important as well. Sure, this is John Hampson, and I'm happy to get it started if you want. Thank you. Um, I have requested access to the document, but I, it hasn't got, I just requested it um, 30 seconds ago. So I haven't <laughs> seen that, but I'll just tell you a little bit about what we do. So we, we, are the, you know, we are the purchasing division of GSA Fleet. We're the tip of the sphere, and we get the vehicles on contract. We set up the minimums, the options, the requirements from the engineering side and they get the vehicles on contract. So when the federal customer goes to buy a vehicle in a program we have called Auto Choice, they're getting a vehicle that that is, I like to say, when you order a BLT, you get a BLT. So it's, they don't have to necessarily be a vehicle expert to know when they order that compact sedan, 12 passenger shuttle bus, or maybe it's an 80,000 pound tractor trailer that it does what it's supposed to do. So each year we have uh, we have we have seven different federal standards that group and look at each vehicle, the vehicles as a group. We have uh, we have them for buses, we have them for sedans, we have them for light trucks, and we have them for medium and, and medium and heavy trucks. We have them for wheelchairs. So these are the governing documents that might say, well, we need daytime running lights. We need to have all these different things. And then when, when it breaks down specifically, each standard item number, for example, for example, a 9C is a, is a compact sedan. So that is that defines what a compact sedan is. 
And each vendor knows that in order to compete with other compact sedans, it has to meet our minimum, which sedans are pretty easy. There isn't a whole lot to them. Um, nothing like a tractor trailer or a bus and things like that. So, um, so we have a whole slew of over 300 standard item numbers that are available to be purchased. And with respect to sustainability, it certainly has been a big part of our world. What we've done for literally the last oh, three decades um, or so has been to try to keep up with the executive orders that require alternative fuels and things like that along the way. So we don't procure engineering vehicles or test vehicles. We're producing, we're procuring and getting on the menu and on contracts commercially available vehicles. Mm -hmm. So, um, and certainly a big part of that has been, you know, in the 90s, it was alternative fuel vehicles and electric vehicles started creeping into it. And we follow the industry trends for fuel economy and everything else. We generally don't have any, you know, we, we, we follow DOE's fuel economy ratings and all that. And, but, and, and so the customers throughout the last three decades have, have had various various executive orders guiding there and requiring their alternative fuel purchase requirements. Of course, electric vehicle is, is an alternative fuel vehicle. So is a hybrid electric. So is a, so is a um, natural gas powered vehicle and things like that. So we've gotten all these vehicles up on the, on the menu so they can be purchased. The other thing that's been kind of a byproduct just of evolution in the auto industry is just better fuel economy in general. So, you know, today's, Suburban gets 20 miles to the gallon on the highway, whereas in 15 years ago, they probably got about 13 or 14. So that's been a byproduct of, of all this. So we have, um, we, we've always tried to offer everything that we could, whatever alternative fuel choices it was, whether it's natural gas, electric, whatever it is, we'll get it out there. And even today, as they, as they come to us and bring bring us electric buses, trucks, things like that. We assess them. We make sure they'll perform the, the mission required by the customer, including minimum range and things like that. And then we get them on contract. We, we set the minimum standards so that they, they do what the customer needs, whether it's four tires or six tires or eight tires or whatever it might be. And we get them on contract, the customer can go buy it and, and know that they're purchasing a vehicle that's gonna meet their needs. So that's what we do. Thanks, John. Catherine, sure. you, why don't you jump in and, and tell us, and let me just restate the question. Um, can you describe your role in acquisitions and, and how you incorporate sustainability and environmental practices within your current role, if at all? Did, I'm sorry, did you, did you say Catherine? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't hear you because my computer is really low today. I work for the multiple award schedule, so I work for Mass PSHC, and we actually do have um, clauses now in in response to the executive order um, that are out there for environmental. Um, and so we're a lot of it's dealing with products too, but we do have the services, professional services, and um specifically with products they have to actually um identify how they're environmentally um efficient and they have to actually it ha they have to have certain things posted in their gsa advantage catalog also on their website they have to show evidence and proof of it i don't actually award the product side um i'm more with the professional services but we do do we do do the environmental um services so i don't have as much experience as i would say um and I missed his name. He just disappeared off my screen. I'm looking at all um, of you guys and he just <laughs> went away. Um, I don't know <laughs> where he went. But that's, the, we, we do actually have this. And I know ITC, um, mass ITC, they do a lot of handling that. I just don't have as much experience with it. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm looking across our focus group uh, individuals and I'm having a difficult time identifying who's part of our focus group and who might be a member of the public. So I'm gonna go ahead and just let um, someone else jump in and describe the work that you're doing. Yeah, we have the, the two Michaels, Michael Wesley and Michael Cahill. Perfect. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, we're members of the IOA group, the, the quality group. 
And what we do is we go and inspect all the vehicles and ensure that all the specifications created by John Hampson's group are present <laughs> in vehicles. Mm -hmm. And we, we have no latitude to alter anything. Mm -hmm. It's whatever is defined by the contract that's made by the contracting officer and the specifications that John's group does. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Um, one of the topics that we're going to be discussing later looks at this issue of automation to make this process easier, and that I think is one example. All right, anyone else? Uh, we have Michael Cahill. Michael, can you hear us? You might be on mute, possibly. There you go. Sorry, here we go. Sorry, I'm in the hotel, um, and I'm I'm trying to do this. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yep, thanks for doing it from a okay. hotel, Michael. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, I I do the same thing as uh, Michael Wesley. You know, we just help out John's group by uh, going and in, in doing those insight inspections. And um, a, a little bit more on it is as is getting ready for uh, who's going to be awarded contracts and stuff. We go out to help um, give him some more information. So um, environmentally, maybe ISO 1400 and something like that, um, we'll take a look at. But uh, pretty much what Mike Wesley said. Great. And is Zachary here? Yeah, it's Zachary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he might be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jump on in, Zachary. Yes, ma'am, of course. So uh, we work closely. We're So I'm part of the uh, contracting team for uh, light vehicles, uh, and we work hand-in-hand -hand with, uh, with John and his team uh, regularly for our uh, recompetes in our open season. Um, time frames and uh we of course like any contracting uh individual out there any contracting team out there or anything um on the contracting side uh clauses and and, and you know things like that yeah. um and we of course ensure that we we get everything into play that needs to uh that needs to be in play and um we know that uh electric uh, electrification of um uh, you know, government fleets and uh, moving into electric vehicles um, being a very big part of this administration's agenda. Uh, you know, we're we're there to uh, do our best to uh, ensure that um, you know that that happens and that we we meet those those goals. So that's in a nutshell, uh, I guess, how we add to the equation. That's great. Mark, would you like to jump in for a second? Yes, thank you, Nicole. Um, I, I gotta say, I really like being around like-minded people and, and we're all on the same page. That is not what happens at the state at all. Uh, there, there's layers of government where you have the governor that says one thing, you've got the agencies doing their own thing and we're all siloed. We don't talk to each other. So when it comes to trying to do sustainable purchasing, there's no law, there's no policy. Everybody's incentive is to not stick their neck out, not be different, and not order sustainable items. They order the cheapest one, because that's what the procurement code says. So how do you learn about these things? Well, I personally like it. I have nothing to do with the purchasing right now. That may change. But right now I'm in a different office, but I love this topic so much and I want to make a difference in New Mexico. So I'm involved, went to Glasgow, I read, I'm teaching a class from New Mexico State University. I uh, partnered with Department of Transportation to try to get EV charging stations out. I partnered with Department of Information Technology to try to get broadband out. But it's really a struggle because nobody is really trying to do this if they don't have to. And there's nothing that says that they do. So go feds, <laughs> let's make the best practices so the states can learn from you. So we, there we you go, you heard it first, Mark. <laughs> Spot on. So hopefully what the work that we're doing here can serve as backdrop for others to follow. It provides a roadmap, not just for you, yeah, GSA, but for a wide swath of organizations. Well, the, do, do you mind if I ask a, a question? Yeah. Uh, John, I want to understand a little bit about the um, incorporation of sustainability into the 
uh, into purchasing, I'll, I'll call it fleet. Um, and you, you mentioned there's seven sort of types um, that you purchase like sedan, tractor trailer, mm -hmm. bus, et cetera. Um, and each one will have a distinct set of, is it standard requirements across the board? So for, for sedans or buses, there'll be a standard set of government wide requirements you're going to put in place. Right. To sort of form the baseline of what you purchase. Right. Right. Like the same, you know, the same documents and, and guidelines that, that go govern buses wouldn't work very well on compact sedans. So that's what makes it separate. total sense. It's mostly based on gross vehicle weight rating, but um, so for the most part. Across those seven categories, is there a standard for sustainability that you uh, is incorporated into each one of those seven types? For instance, um, fuel efficiency, like that is one sort of sustainability green requirement that it may it may be different. The number may be different per category, but that requirement is something that cuts across all seven that each and every time you go out to market you are considering fuel efficiency across the board. So we don't have a requirement, but it's reported yeah. with everything. So when you go into auto choice, you can see the greenhouse gas scores for anything. Let's say you're buying a, you're buying a half ton crew cab pickup and maybe it's a Chevy Silverado and F-150 and, and, and a Ram and a Ram 1500. You can see there's no minimum requirement for it, because we have customers that literally need all three of them, or we even have more. We have Nissan and other brands too, for whatever reason. Um, there's so there's not a requirement, but the data is reported on every single one. So as a customer, you can make the purchasing decision if that's part of what you're you're purchasing for. And our leasing side uses that looks for the low greenhouse gas score when they purchase things when they mm -hmm. purchase things for their for the GSA owned fleets. We have two different groups mm -hmm. of customers, really. We have GSA owns about 200,000 vehicles and leases them out to federal customers. And it's a full service lease. So they purchase the vehicles, get them to the customers, close to the customers. Customer uses them for between five and 10 years, depending on what it is. Yep. Then the customer turns them back in and, and the leasing side sells them. So on the leasing side, they do try to buy the, the lowest greenhouse score gas they can find. And on uh, for and the purchasing customers, all of them, anybody that purchases can see the score and they can also see the uh, they can see the fuel economy too. It tends to be relatively similar. You know, most of the crew cab half ton pickups are going to be pretty similar, but it does give the customer the opportunity to to get in there and and research it a little more if that's a part of their purchasing criteria absolutely and then there's an eo around uh purchasing a certain number or percentage that are electric or hybrid so right now so there have been executive orders since i started in 1990 I started in 98, but 93, there was an executive order that I worked on when I was a DOE contractor. And right, so um, right, so that was to purchase a certain percentage of alternative fuel vehicles. 2027, there, the, the requirement is that all vehicles, all light duty vehicles be electric, 2027. So that's what we're ramping up for right now. Mm -hmm. Got and, it. So and, you're and, building that into all the yep, requirements now yep, for light duty. Yep, yep, exactly. So, and and that's not, that's not a specific requirement we have, you know, that we're putting GSA, that's the administration has said that's, yeah. that's the executive order driving that. So that'll be anything under, unless they change it, light duty is 8,500 pounds and under. So now that's, you know, things change, but that's, it's been 8,500 pounds per year. So. And when that EO came out, how do you craft that requirement? Is it something that someone helped you craft um or did you write the requirement because you're so experienced in the world of vehicles clearly and well, and now it's a standard across well, anytime you purchase alternative light vehicle uh, light duty vehicles so um the white house does work with us um and, and bounce ideas we kind of work hand in hand and collaborate with each other on these things um from that's there's more policy folks in our shop that do that but they also they bounce things off the engineering and the purchasing shop so so we don't write the executive order obviously no, uh, but yeah. we but we provide feedback on it 
and you know uh, you know sometimes that feedback might be it's it, you know it's it's right on the mark or sometimes maybe we, we recommend some tweaking but but we follow the lead and we and we and hopefully the executive orders come up with something that we can find in the open market that supports it you know because we really we don't go and have specialty vehicles built or anything like that we're buying mainstream products but we're following these trends that the, yeah. the you know that the industries you know if, if the executive order had said by 2024 100 percent of all light duty vehicles have to be electric we know that's not possible there's just not enough yeah out there there's just not enough configurations and things like that so so we always hope that you know as these executive orders have you know evolved over the years that we can find the commodities to support it. But you're writing the requirements for the contract. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think this is a really, really good segue back to this core competency issue around sustainability and environment. So you're writing the, the specifics to the contract and others are undertaking your jobs. How are you presently acquiring knowledge about environmental and sustainability practices? Is this being done through formal training? Is it continuous training? Are you acquiring this knowledge informally or through online sources or other mechanisms? What, what can you tell us? How are you getting this information? Well, uh, um, let me think about that. So a lot of it would be, we do a lot of focus groups. We tend, mm -hmm. we attend uh, the various lots of, 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 of events around it. For example, in March, we'll go to the NTEA, which is a big truck event. So we'll sit down with all the truck vendors and engine providers and transmission providers and all that and have conversations with, with what they with, what's going on with them, what they see happening. Uh, so it's really a collaborative effort with, between us and the industry to see what what's on the horizon, what we can do, what we can what we can ask for. Because yeah, we can't ask for what can't be built, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Or we can't ask for something that's that's um, prohibitively expensive. Yeah. So, and we and really, we buy commercially available vehicles. So then that's part of our our, our liaisonship with the White House is that we try to we work with CEQ to let them know, okay, hey, this is what we think is going to be available one year from now, three years from now, and things like that. So it's, you know, it's to some degree, it's always the chicken and the egg thing. I'm not going to lie to you that, you know, and, and sometimes, sometimes it goes out too far and sometimes it doesn't. And, and we try to, but as far as training, we get a lot of industry training from meeting with our vendors, um, various events and things like that. Um, so that's, that's what we try to do. So, so how about the others? How are you currently gaining your sustainability and environmental information? How are you acquiring this knowledge? I know when the clause the, in our solicitation, we do do like monthly training sessions on it. We have like a mass, it's like um, mass training sessions, I think is what it's called. They do do and, training and sessions. And that's M-A-S-S? -S? Yes, we call it MASS. There's multiple award schedule like MASS. They do do training sessions on different things that are in our solicitation, especially when they see mm -hmm. if contract specialists or contracting officers are not as familiar with how to mm -hmm. properly um, evaluate things to make sure that they're meeting what they're supposed to be meeting, especially with products. And we'll do training sessions to make sure that we're evaluating um, that the vendors or offers are actually meeting those requirements. And that's your office that's doing that, Catherine? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Okay. How about others here? How are you, how are you acquiring this knowledge? And, and maybe I should go back to you, Catherine. If you're doing the training, how are you getting the knowledge to undertake the training? I actually, well, we have a team. We have, a, I would say we have an actual team that does the training for us. Like I'm not giving the training. We have actual people that just specialize in providing that training quarterly, uh, monthly. Sometimes we're doing it weekly and they actually set up calendar invites and, and they're mandatory sometimes. And sometimes they're not. A lot of times they're mandatory, especially when they're going through and doing like like many PMRs and they were saying, okay, this was not done correctly or we didn't make sure that they met this. Um, they're, they're making sure that we're meeting that, getting the training that we need to make sure that we're evaluating things properly. And Catherine, when you're inserting uh, clauses into your contracts or RFPs around sustainability, 
where do you get that language? The clauses. Um, and I don't actually write the mass solicitation. We have our mass PMO. They write the solicitation, but they're, okay. they know the executive orders that come out. So they're getting them from the executive orders. I know when I was on the frontline forum last year and the clauses got inserted, like I knew from being on the frontline forum that those clauses were, that they were going to come out in response to those executive orders. So I kind of said, hey, be on the lookout because these, these are going to, and that they popped up in the solicitation. Okay. So. So what is your role in relation to sort of like you don't write the solicitation, no. you I, evaluate them. I, I evaluate. Uh, Got it. Uh, an award so how do you know how to evaluate the, the sustainability portions of that RFP response? Yeah, I go through, I have to go through training because that's like, I don't have like, especially for the products, like knowing that they've met like that part. Because I, I mainly, before we did the yeah. math, consolidation which is a whole new thing so we just did that two years ago um mm -hmm. itc was mainly doing a lot of the products where a lot of that was happening um so we've had to go through a lot of training on that Catherine, what what do you call what's the acronym mass again mass is multiple award schedule thank you so you're you have rfp responses in and they have sections around sustainability and you're thinking how do i evaluate this portion mm -hmm. who do you call or like to say can you train me or <laughs> I, I will definitely reach out to our top procurement analysts and oh, procurement analysts mm -hmm. our 14s and 15s i will reach out to them and like I need, we need training on this we need to know how we're going to evaluate them and, and a lot of times we'll have um like offer office memorandums where we'll have um, policy written out that'll actually, it'll be like 10 pages long. Okay, guys, this is how you're going to evaluate this. And, but they'll do training sessions on it. And you'll oh, see your like procurement analysts will do training? Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the- mass we, we, Along with like top contracting officers too, it won't just be procurement analysts doing the training. It's, it's is it FAI like, ever, or it's just it's internal procurement specialists? I think they probably. I'm not sure. I'd have to get yeah. back to you on that. Yeah, that's all right, Catherine. I didn't mean to grill you. I was just oh, so no, curious no, how I, it actually. I'm, I'm actually thinking of these are going to be questions I'm going to probably go back and ask. Uh, yeah. yeah, I so, think this is really useful because it sounds like this is a pretty important entry point for knowledge yeah. dissemination. Yeah. How how about others on the on the focus group? or within the focus group, how are you getting knowledge around sustainability? Uh, I, I do it through um, the DAU. We have courses on there that we can review as well as the GSA online university. So when, um, you know, we got a lot of mandatory stuff that pops up there that I'll take a look at and, and go through. Um, and then just like Catherine, we'll get um, meeting invites throughout the month. Um, for certain pop-up trainings that we can uh, call into and, and listen into um, and get trained that way. Is it helpful? Like, so, you know, you, Michael, you show up and you inspect the vehicles and you want to make sure they're ISO compliant or do you go back to your training to understand what to look for to make sure those vehicles are compliant with what the supplier promised or are you learning another way? Oh, a lot of it's kind of on-site stuff. So the, the training is helpful in that it kind of gives me a baseline to understand a little bit what they're talking about um, yeah. because I'm not ISO expert at all. Um, yeah. But when they come back and say, here's our certification, here's how we got it, I kind of go through um, a little bit about what they told me. And I kind of just a one plus one equals two type thing. Like I just use logic to understand that what they're telling me is true or not um, based on what I'm seeing at their location when I inspect their vehicles and things like that. Got it. Thank you. I think it was a little bit different when I worked for DOD um, because when I worked for DOD, I was working with like C-130s and uh, C-5 planes. So I had like engineers and I had industrial analysts right there and you would go out and actually physically see the planes and they would, you know, you would be working through all that with them. So it's a little bit different um, here because I'm not doing that type of um, work anymore. Um, but yeah, like he, like what Michael was saying. So were those um, engineers and others 
very knowledgeable about sort of sustainability requirements. Yes. Were they focused and they were focused on it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's a million other things you're thinking about with the C130, but you oh, know. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So the next set of questions is going to look at capabilities and resources and skills that help empower you to make the best sustainability and environmental decisions. Zachary, I'm going to I'm going to talk with you. Do you believe that you have the capabilities, skills, and resources to empower you to make the best sustainability decisions? I mean, as you know, kind of stated here uh, so far, uh, GSA does a a good job of. Uh, you know, putting us through uh, trainings when when things change uh, and mm -hmm. uh, as things uh, as things develop, including when we're talking about uh, you know sustainability and it's not like uh, it's not like engineering does one thing and contracting does something else. It, it's everybody all plays you know plays into it because we you know we we get a a lot of direction, um, you know, through the program management office um, as well. And I don't think we have any representation here today, um, you know, from our program management office. But, you know, we have a whole, just like anybody here, we have a, you know, everything flows down um, and we are supported pretty well here uh, compared to, you know, some of the other agencies that I've worked for. So, um I do think that that's a you know a, a big part of it um, because it helps to ensure that the programs uh, you know are doing what they need to be doing from how the White House and administration and upper level individuals you know shape it and want it to be done, uh, which you know comes down to our engineering folks um, who are putting the standards together you know to to our contracting folks that are you know placing. Um, you know, in putting the mechanism for, you know, the vehicle for, for making those purchases. And we you know, have the other, other people that keep the systems running. And, and so, you know, it's, it's all, it's all a group effort uh, here. Um, um, what, one of the, what I'm hearing you say is you feel supported and there's trust in the system. You feel, you believe that there's a scaffolding that's in place. I'm curious what the barriers are that you see related to empowering you to make the best sustainability decisions? Well, I mean, I don't know if I would want to use the term barrier or or not. Um, but I guess going hand in hand with having that support, um, you know, a lot of a lot of decisions that really um, that that affect you know, something like sustainability on the programs and um, you know, trying to author that uh, into into the future, um, which, of course, you realize, you know, things for like, you know, computers, you're on a three, four year cycle um, vehicles, you know, we there's a cycle for that as well. So it's not like every vehicle and every computer is being replaced every year. Um, so, I mean, that creates a bit of difficulty just because it does take a certain lead time for you know changes to really uh, take effect um and then also if we do have a lot of direction from above uh, you know from the program management office some of those decisions on how sustainability is going to be worked into the program you know they're already made um you know at those levels um, and then, of course, we all are compartmentalized on exactly, you know, exactly what we do. Um, so, you know, as you get further and further down that food chain, the less and less that your decisions are specifically, you know, affecting, um, you know, those those changes. You know, it's it's at a higher policy level, um, and again, that's where that's where our training comes from. So, I don't want to call it a barrier. I just want to call it a product of how the you know how the market may work for specifically uh, since we have a lot of TTNL folks here specifically for like vehicles you know this isn't these aren't maintaining IT systems these are buying products that are meant to be fielded for you know longer than the term of the contract in or I guess the term of that fiscal year so 
Thanks. I see Boris wants to jump in. Yeah. Hey, hey, Zachary, I, I wanted to, to explore a little bit more of the, the relationship with the program management office, because that's something we talk about here, too. And I think that's an interesting piece to explore a little more, uh, because, you know, you're that's your customer. They they lay the requirements. And I'm kind of interested if you can comment a little bit on the program management side of things, particularly on, on this area of sustainability when they're when they're laying requirements and when you guys are interacting to, to find the best solution for for the customers. Okay, so, um, you know, of course, in, in the world of of contracting, you know, it, you know, it, generally speaking, you know, the contracting team gets their requirement from somewhere, so from the program management office there. So, when Congress meets uh, and you know, they they say, hey, you know, this year uh, we have our our goals in electrification. We have the targets that that we want to meet. Um, and this is just this is just one specific example. Um, you know, they are looking to like the light vehicles contract just because that is what has the bearing on. Um, you know how they're able to to meet those um, you know, meet those those targets, and one of the specifically for 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 vehicles, you know, being that required source here, you know, the program management office for um, oh, where was I going with that? Maybe I guess they do the best way that I can. You know the best way that I that I can put it is that's flowing down to the program management office, and that's who would report back up. You know, so I mean that's that's really all that my brain that's really all my brain's giving me right now. But uh, I mean, if you have any sure. specific question or anything, I'd be be happy to field it for sure. No, that, that's good. I think I, that was an important, you know, piece of this is that the PMs, I mean, they they lay the requirements, you know, contracting officers are execute, but the requirements for sustainability are going to flow from the PM office. Yeah. How about others? Um, what do you believe are the capabilities, resources, and skills uh, that you need to empower you to make the best sustainability decisions? Do you believe that you have those? skills and knowledge? And if not, what do you think the barriers are to obtaining it? Uh, for, this is Michael for myself. Um, I, I do believe that for my current position, for what I need to do, um, I do have the skills and knowledge needed based through the training um, that we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, and like we talked about, we have a huge, um, you know, support chain. So if I did have a question, I'd be able to get on the phone and find somebody who would be able to answer it, um, who's more knowledgeable. Um, when it comes to barriers for myself, I am a hundred percent field employee. So, um, I said, I'm in a hotel. I was just looking at vehicles this morning. Um, the only barrier for me would just be not being able to have access to when I'm actually looking at the vehicle. Really, all I have there is my phone. Um, so if I can't get a hold of somebody, um, I would be able to. I wouldn't be able to uh, finish whatever I'm doing there to have to go back and kind of reevaluate something maybe a certain uh, another time. Um, but that's yet to happen. Um, with more and more stuff coming out, that could be a possibility. But I'm just trying to kind of you know, brainstorm what a barrier in this position would be. Um, and that's really all that I can come up with. But as I said, as of today, um, I have, I believe all the training and support that I would need to conduct what I do for uh, the government. Yeah. But Michael, if I understood you correctly, you're saying like, look, I'm out in the field. And so if I did have a question about ISO compliance or some sort of sustainability compliance requirement, I'm in the field. So I need to like, have a way to easily find the information I need, whether it's get a subject matter expert on the phone or go to some super duper informative website or, you know, yeah, that so I, that's where, yeah, yeah, that would, that would be, I would go to, you know, I would try to obviously look it up myself, 
first, you know, so if that, if there was a, a, a super yeah. duper website that I could just one click and boom, there it is, that would be amazing. But generally yeah. um, I would go to my supervisor um, first. Uh, if, if he couldn't call uh, answer it, maybe one of my colleagues, um, but then like John's group, they've always been able to uh, answer any questions that we've had out in the field. Um, yeah. I mean, just on a rare, you know, it might be like a Friday at three o'clock where I'm trying to finish something up out in the field where I might not be able to get somebody. But again, this is, I'm just yeah. kind of spitballing as to what might happen. This hasn't happened every time I've tried to reach out. Somebody's been there to kind of answer and help me along. I think I know the answer to this, but have you ever rejected a vehicle because it didn't meet green or sustainability requirements? Um, not, well, uh, not anymore. I mean, way, way back in the day when um, there, the E85 requirements and things were coming out, somebody might have ordered an E85 vehicle and uh, it might have been just a straight, you know, gasoline, uh, regular standard vehicle. But over the last at least five years, no, I have not. But you feel empowered to make that decision. Yeah, if if something came up to where they changed the standard and they said, hey, this is this needs to meet this or um, mm -hmm. this needs to have a certain battery type in order for this unit to be considered uh, as this stage. Um, I'd be able to receive the information, look at it, evaluate it, and decide whether or not it met that. Got it. Oh, go ahead, John, please. So just to, in, in comparison with the, with the other person on here that was doing our actual aircraft design. So we're buying commercially available vehicles, so we really don't have you know, we don't have a magic, oh, it, it ha we're not going to buy it unless it makes, you know, 50 miles per gallon. We're, we're buying commercially available vehicles. So while we do want to offer the customer every opportunity to get the most efficient vehicle, we are not, generally speaking, that's not part of our design requirements. Our design requirements are, and our build specs are based more on what it is capable of, because we've got Really, we've got the NHTSA and DOT. They take care of the safety aspects, right? We require everything comply with federal motor, all the federal motor vehicle safety standards, which is very helpful. So that's lighting and airbags and all that, because that would mm -hmm. be, we'd have to have 10 times as many people to keep up with anything like that. And so, and then on the, um, and then of course, when it comes to efficiency, the corporate average fuel economy and the various other things that are one step ahead of us as as purchasers are out there kind of paving the way so we could follow we can kind of fa we can just follow their their footsteps through as they increase the requirements so we're, we're not designing the vehicle we do some non-standard builds which in, in, in which we do a very small amount of vehicles which we do some real design work in conjunction with manufacturers but the vast majority were buying commercially available vehicles so so just to clarify that a little bit as opposed to the person that might be developing the c-130 and saying hey yeah. can we do a little something to, to to lighten this thing a little bit you know or things like that because the moment that we try to do anything a requirement that doesn't exist or isn't commercially available now it all has to be tested and everything else it's, it's a little different world for us yeah than, so. That, that, that's a good distinction. But even among your commercial purchases, like our sustainability requirements, a nice sound like a nice to have. They're not like a an hard, hard, fast requirement. Other than in light duty vehicles, you have to turn the entire fleet electric. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, and this really touches on one of our specific questions here. Where do you sustainability and environmental considerations rank and as you consider your acquisition options what what i'm hearing is that when it's required you mm -hmm. follow the requirements what happens when it's not required what happens when you have some discretion here is this part of is sustainability part of the decision making criteria where does what what does that conversation look like for you Nicole, uh, Bill Wislowski, I'm uh, the branch chief of the quality assurance branch. Uh, Mike and Mike both report to me. Um, for our group, we're designated cores, which means we have no contractual authority to change any requirements or aspects of the contract requirements. So mm -hmm. our 
function is to ensure that what we are actually being provided is built according to the contract requirements, contains all of the actual specified yeah. equipment yeah. and functions properly. Um, so with that, we couldn't incorporate sustainability requirements. If we were doing so, we'd be uh, enacting a constructive change of the contract, which we're specifically prohibited from doing. So yeah. for our end of it, we are, we're, we're essentially ensuring that what the contracting officer has put into place has been followed. Yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely. I think, um, I think it really begs this next question. Uh, we're thinking about possible credentialing for acquisition professionals who advance, uh, who, are, who are seeking to advance their sustainability and environmental knowledge. As we think about the different stages of the acquisition process, what stage do you think we should be focusing on first for this credentialing? What we're trying to achieve is the greatest impact. So where do you see that level and that stage of the acquisition workforce process as being most important? I just want to chime in. Um, you know, I think what we're forgetting here is the fact that, you know, we do work hand in hand with, with industry, you know, with industry yeah. partners. Uh, and, you know, they they have a big bearing as well on you know, this, the whole just the whole thing behind sustainability, whether it is a decision that they're making for their bottom line, uh, a decision that they're making to try to receive some sort of a special credit that's, you know, been place been put into place by law. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of it comes down to what they're you know, what they're required, you know, what they're required to do. And it, it, it does not make sense for the government to try to put together their technical requirements for, you know, for vehicles um, without having industry in as a true partner on that. Yeah, you know, because we get limited to what the industry may be able to provide or at what speed they may be able to uh, put into play, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that goes around sustainability. And I think here, a lot of the sustainability is a, is at the forefront of, you know, what the administrations, the recent administrations, the current administration, um, it's been very important uh, to them. And so I think that you've had a lot of law, a lot of regulation put into place that kind of takes away the need for when you drill down to say the contract, you know, the contracting team or the engineering team or down to the IOAs for that, that do our inspections, you know, it, uh, a lot of it gets taken care of at that, at that higher level. Um, and, it, it, and I think that's kind of, uh, kind of an, it's necessitated by the way that the, that the machine works. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that sustainability's greatest impact would be, you know, the, to to get that greatest impact would to be ensure that the highest levels are doing as much as they can to ensure that the proliferation is across the agency, not just across a specific program. So I just kind of wanted to chime in uh, quickly on those two things. Great points. Agree 100%. And so related to this issue of credentialing and um, for acquisition professionals, Zachary, I'm inferring from this that it, at the higher level is going to be more important because they're the ones formulating the different policies that are moving forward. Uh, sure. And, 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 you know, that, that, that is the case I uh, hear and, you know, that that's kind of just the product of how contracting works and for, for good reason. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to have that, to have that separation, um, you know, it allows where we could drill down on you know, specific programs like the light, light, like light vehicles, you know, TTNL themselves would put into play something that deals with sustainability that would be both product that we get on our side of TTNL, as well as the services on the, you know, on the other side of, of, of TTNL. So, um you know, it's a lot easier to ask the hard questions and the big questions about sustainability when you are purchasing a product, but you know, it's a lot 
there's a lot more that goes into it for you know for like the service side uh, of of things. Uh, just because with products, you know, finding sustainability is very is very tangible. But what's the gas mileage on this? What kind of an engine does you know does this have? Is this an electrical vehicle that's meeting um, you know what you know, what our administration you know is is looking for? And the you know the reason I keep saying the administration is because um, I know at one point in time, my understanding was there was a vote that was delayed um before, until the contracts to the light vehicle contracts were put into play so um you know i just i hope that that helps answer your question it does it does okay. thank you how about to others where do you think the the training is going to have the biggest impact and the credentialing within gsa I actually have a question. Are there, do you have credentials now? Are credentials, uh, training and credentials used for the work that you're doing currently? Unrelated to sustainability, Daryl? Or related to related. any other, any other um, aspect of uh, purchasing or evaluations? Sure, so I could, I could delve into that just for a quick answer, right? So we have obviously our core training, all of our engineers are either core one, two, or three. And um, so that, that gets the basic core knowledge and we use um, a number of tools to keep them knowledgeable in their areas, particularly attending um, events. Um, like our bus engineer goes to BusCon, which is a big bus event. And we also have him take online training and things like this. And, and our, our, our vocational truck and our medium and heavy truck folks will go to an event next month in Indianapolis called NTEA National Truck Equipment Association um, event. So we learn at these events, uh, you know, and it's, it's not just about sustainability. Obviously, it's about weight distribution and safety and everything else that goes along with it. Um, so our our federal standards mostly relate back to does the vehicle does the vehicle perform the mission the customer expects it to so if they're buying a compact sedan does it seat five people you know because we would have people if we didn't if we didn't have that in there some people would take the back seat out and offer it cheaper than the next people right you know what i mean that's right, 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 that's right, kind right. of the world we live in sure. so um so most of what we do much of what we do is to um support the, the mission critical requirements of the customer and then but at the same time at the very least we report back the greenhouse gas scores and every and 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 uh, the fuel economy and all that that goes along with it even in the different configurations for example if they choose a different engine we try to get that that greenhouse gas score you know a different engine or transmission we try to have all that available to the customer so the purchasing customer, when they go to purchase, they can make the decision that best suits their their needs and can be, you know, ideally the greenest as well. So I don't know if that helps at all. Okay, thank you. I'm going back to this question of credentialing and uh, in thinking about possible credentialing for acquisition professionals who are looking for sustainability knowledge, what stages of the process do you think are gonna have the biggest impact? I mean, I definitely think as a contracting officer, it would be helpful to have credentials, just to have that training and have credentials if you're gonna be awarding it and, and evaluating it. I definitely think credentials would be important. Thanks, Catherine. The next uh, question is looking at performance assessment. 
Um, in what ways do you think GSA's existing accountability process should be modified to empower individuals to embed sustainability considerations in federal acquisition? And how should it be measuring accountability within your ranks, um, anticipating that sustainability is becoming more and more of an emphasis? So how, how would that connect to the work that you're doing in your performance reviews? And, and what might be the best places to be emphasizing performance review for sustainability? Again, looking across the entire acquisition life cycle. Who should be accountable? When you look at accountability for meeting sustainability requirements, you have to take a look at where they're operating in. Um, on vehicle purchasing, for example, John and his team has, have gone a long way along with our contracting folks to get as many electric vehicles on contract as possible. However, we have no controls over the amount, the number of vehicles that are being produced by our suppliers, nor the uh, the amount that they've actually held back in reserve to allow for us to purchase. So, you know, while we while they purchase as many as possible, trying to meet the president's goals, you know, we've fallen short of that and we have no control over it. So you can't exactly hold the contracting office or the purchasing division uh, liable for not procuring the vehicles when, you know, we did everything in our power to make them available as to where the market will, will allow for. And you're gonna to have to take a look at that across the board with everything else. I mean, a contracting officer, they can only purchase things that they can act, that are actually being offered at the time. I think that's an excellent point. Mark, go ahead and jump in. Thank you, Nicole. So I, I thought a little bit about this uh, unavailability of vehicles to purchase. We'd like to purchase some too. What I'm hearing is that the dealers want to add in all the extras so they make maximum profit because with electric vehicles, you only see them if they need brakes or tires. Everything else seems to work twice as long as the internal combustion engine option. So my thinking was that maybe I could leverage through NASPO, which is a national purchasing organization for states, to deal, to actually negotiate a deal with the manufacturers, like Ford is now doing direct sales, Tesla is doing direct sales. Why can't we do on the federal level a negotiation, including all states, and say, we want 10% of your production at the state level without all the gadgets and everything so that we can get the base price? You will not find a Lightning for $40,000. You'll find it for $80,000, but we can't get them. So forget about it. We can't buy them. So we're stuck with buying what's left over, like the 2020 Chevy Bolts that can't be charged quicker than three days. So we're really in a quandary, and we like to look to the federal government to use the GAS, which we can adopt for our purchases. I think that's the that that might be the key. Kristen, you were going to jump in here. Oh, I'm so slow on the button today. Um, thanks, Nicole. Actually, it was back on the previous uh, subject matter. Yeah. But so, you know, as I'm listening to this is when we talk about the credentialing, it sounds like what I'm hearing is a lot of your roles are kind of matching up uh, requirements with marketplace availability. And so do you kind of envision that one of the discussions we've been having is, you know, does that credentialing knowledge allow you to better understand these elements or does does it even empower and allow you to push back on some of those with the folks you're actually procuring from? Um, because I really don't I don't really have a vantage point of of your level of work there. So is it more like compliance or is it a way that you can actually negotiate is probably not the right word, but engage with the suppliers and kind of drive the the spirit of what the requirement is. I, I think it's kind of a combination of both. Okay. Definitely, would you say, I think from a confidence perspective, it kind of um, helps, I guess, be more um, assertive with the requirements of the government, for lack of a better term. Yeah. And then, 
and 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 probably uh, yeah I, I guess definitely and also just you know getting on their level and being able to understand you know talk you know be able to when you use the word negotiate I would say that was a really good way to state it you know to better understand and be able to talk to them and um and I you know, yeah I, I think the way you said it it was pretty ad, you know adequate my second question was and is realistically I know everybody everybody's schedule is super super busy so when you hear about credentialing and other training. I mean, how is the general bandwidth to be able to take that training, put it into practice, um, you know, as, you know, just in, in today's day and environment, I think it's tough for a lot of folks. Do, do you mean like how to find time to take the training? Is that what, yeah. the, what you're meaning? Um, you can tell I'm from the IT community. I use the word uh, with, so <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> well, and, and to add to that, how do you find the time? What modalities most lend themselves to your band, the constraints on your bandwidth? Are there certain modalities that would help you get credentialed more than others? Such as like a self-paced learning versus yeah. heard many of you mentioned there's training or there's a session, a lunch and learn session you go to, but you know, just some discussion on how best you learn, how best you find time, you know, any any thoughts on that as we're starting to kind of figure this out. I mean, I'm pretty flexible. I'm, I'm not going to speak for everyone in here, but I'm pretty flexible in the way that I learn. So I can learn like, like online, like, like this in this kind of session. Um, if, if they need me to go somewhere, I can do that. So I'm pretty flexible in the way that I learn, but some people are not that way. So, I mean, it's a lot easier to fit. Like if it's like a virtual setting, it's easier because, and I don't know if everyone is like, I'm, I'm very virtual in, in the way I'm in my work environment. So like it's easier to fit time in to take training, um, but not everyone may be that way. They may, the more people may be going into the office or may be traveling more with the way that their the way their schedules are with work. Great, thank you. I'd like to. I'd really like to hear from others related to Kristen on the bandwidth issue and and recognizing that we're all doing a lot more in our work than we likely did when we started our jobs. Um, how, how if, if we're thinking about increasing knowledge and capacity within GSA, what sorts of modalities would be really important? So there's the online synchronous, there's online asynchronous, which is self-paced in person, the lunch and learns that Kristen mentioned. What do you think would be the nice to have and what will be the essential to have based on the work that you undertake? Based on my work schedule, um, I like the online stuff so I can get to it um, You know, when I have the time. Um, my schedule varies month to month um, when it comes to looking at doing these end item inspections. Um, sometimes I'm notified three days uh, before I have to go out there, you know, essentially they let us know and then we have a certain amount of calendar days before we have to actually get out there and look at them. So I might in my mind think, oh man, next week's all clear. I can do a, a 40 hour training session and then all of a sudden, hey, we got 20 vehicles you need to look at. So it can change on a dime like that. So when it does come to training, I much prefer, prefer the smaller training. So, um, you know, a one to three hour session that I can knock out if I do have a little free time versus the 20 to 40 hour sessions. Um, and if it does come to in-person stuff, that's when I do like the, the week breakdown. I don't want to go for one day for a personal training. If I'm going to do a personal in, in, you know, on-site training, um, I'd like to just spend the week there, get everything done that incorporates it. Um, but yeah, outside of that, the, the shorter one to three hour kind of time frame trainings work best for me. And, and then virtually is, is my preferred method. How about others? I think this is a really important conversation. I think that, you know, his comments going to hold true probably for, for most of our folks because they're intermixing um, 
you know, various vendor visits, um, sometimes pre-construction visits to vehicles. And I also just think it's generally be going to be kind of challenging. You know, we could teach the engineers how to require the greenhouse gas scores to be 200, but, but we can't put any requirement in there really that isn't commercially available because, you know, it costs a tremendous amount of money to remap, um, you know, to dyno test and remap anything, to recalibrate anything. If you even look at the differences between uh, a vehicle that's offered in 40 states versus 50 states, we more or less have to follow suit with where the industry is. And of course, the industry is following the lead of, of in, in cafe, corporate average fuel economy, and other things, and while at the same time trying to kind of go forward and plan out where they need to be in 2027. I think that's why you're, you know, you're seeing more vehicle lines being offered as electric. So I think, you know, even if you, you know, the engineers are kind of limited what they can do with respect to um, greening, because we more or less have to take what's available to us there. You know, it's not, we can't really say, well, we're going to try to put a double overdrive transmission in this, in this, um, Toyota Camry, because if it's not already in there and not something they're producing commercially, either we're going to pay orders of magnitude more for it, or it's just not going to be available. That's kind of the world that we have to live in. Now, that doesn't mean we can't, and in and, and our sister organization, our leasing side, you know, they do take all the efforts to procure the most fuel efficient vehicles they can. The From the purchasing division, we're trying to get everything on the menu that we can that meets the meets the requirements. And no matter where we were as far as what we tried to require, we we, we can't really get ahead of what's what's thermodynamically possible, shall we say, and you know, commercially available. So we, you know, we can't ask a vendor to get 40 miles to the gallon out of an F-150. We can't just put that in there as a requirement because they won't bid on it. You know, and then our customer won't have that F-150. So we have to we have to follow suit with where the industry is, quite honestly. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean we can't encourage it and and try to pick up everything out there that's 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 coming on to the market. We do that with all the you know hybrid electrics and plug-in hybrid electrics and electrics, and we try to pull everything in, but we we can't, regardless of what we put in those standards, we're not gonna change the way. The entire business yeah. does business, I guess I should say. Uh, John, I have a question. Um, are there any examples from your experience and work where you were, where the government was were able to drive the industry? I mean, this is not always the industry driving what's there, but were there any examples where you were able to drive the industry to a certain place? Uh, so to a small degree, probably probably GSA working more in conjunction with say DOT, NHTSA, or the White House kind of working collaboratively to let those agencies take the lead in requiring it as opposed to mm -hmm. GSA putting out it as a requirement. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm not quite doing it justice, but um, more working collaboratively, say with the White House or, or DOT. And, um, you know, we, we certainly have worked hand in hand with them and, and in some cases, you know, we have a requirement for daytime running lights. It doesn't necessarily exist. That's not a DOT requirement. That's a requirement that we think makes sense. It's commercially available. It costs a few dollars more a vehicle. So we put it out there and it's more of a programming thing more than it is, okay, we need to put a different transmission or a different calibration or take 150 pounds out of this vehicle to get there. So um, there are no, GSA generally, you know, buys commercially available. But does work closely with 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 say, NHTSA, DOT, and the White House. They're 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 a step ahead of us with the requirements. Let's put it that way. And DOE, Department of Energy, mm -hmm. and EPA, of course. You know, so DOE, EPA, and DOT are one step ahead of us with the requirements. Regarding credentials, is there a perception that? Credentials advance one professionally. Catherine's going to jump in. <laughs> I I mean I think some people feel that way. I personally don't. 
I don't really think of when I get credentials as I'm trying to advance my career. I think of it as I'm trying to get the most knowledge I can get to mm -hmm. to be able to succeed in my like to to yeah. be able to succeed and be knowledgeable. But there mm -hmm. are people that will just go out there and seek as many credentials as they can get because they think it's going to help them climb the, the, the work ladder as high mm -hmm. as they can get. Yeah, and I, I I may not have worded it correctly because I wasn't necessarily thinking just in terms of like, you know, it would promote you or you'd move into a higher paying job. I yeah. guess I meant more like you, you might be perceived more as a subject matter expert and others may rely on you more and you may uh, just have a different maybe professional status, even if it's informal. It, do you have that perception? Yeah, I think some people, yeah, some people might, and they may be kind of scared to get the credentials because they're like, oh, I don't want to be relied on as a subject matter <laughs> expert on something. Um, I mean, people may get scared about that, you know, that that's, yeah. that's extra work. If I have a credential, <laughs> that's extra work I have to do. Um, I don't know if anybody else feels that way but some people shy away from that because they're worried they're going to be seen as a you know I don't know yeah yeah thanks for your honesty <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm sure a lot of other people feel that way <laughs> Zachary were you going to jump in uh you caught me turning the video back on there didn't you <laughs> um, so something and it kind of goes back to uh, the first, I'll call it version one of the question and version two of the question. Version one being, you know, whatever position that we are in, there's a certain tool belt that goes along with it and certain slots on the tool belt that need to be filled. And yes, there are individuals who might, there might be 12 slots to fill. They might fill three and say, that's good enough. You know, let's, let's try to do something else. Let's try to you know, move up, you know, move up the ladder. Now, I know that wasn't really the intention of the question, but something that, you know, I would point out would be my experience with a, you know, with a different agency where uh, if you did get yourself, you know, credentialed in something greater, I'll say greater than where you're at or greater than what you're doing, you know, people were taken advantage of and that does exist. And, um, you know, I could either let that make me shy away from it, uh, moving here to GSA, or I can just realize that whatever, you know, whoever it was before is not who it is now. So yes, that, that, you know, that, that may be the case. Um, but I just kind of wanted to, to, I guess, frame it in that way a little bit on you know what the what the prior experiences, you know, uh, uh, might be, uh, and honestly, you know, subject matter expert and being one is something that comes along with you know with time, um, and somebody who's time and grade, time in a, a career field, time in a position, um, they're you know, everybody's learning ability is is different. I came from I came from a world where I trained. Uh, I was an administrative contracting officer, and I trained other uh, administrative contracting officers. So I've been on that side, and everybody, you know, everybody learns differently. Everybody's ability is, you know, at a at a certain level, uh, and all those things go into shaping. Of I, I hear, you know, credentialing being, uh, uh, you know, a big part here. Um, so, but therein lies also the food chain. Um, you know, if if I want to, if if I want to have more of a say as I become closer and closer to what you would describe as a subject matter expert, I can move into the program management side of things. I can move into the policy side of things where I might be able to have a greater impact. Like me personally have a greater impact vice being a an oiled cog in the entire machine um, you know making sure that whatever the input is we get the greatest output it's really that's crazy. really interesting that's sort of like part of what I heard you saying was mm -hmm. the one of the benefits of becoming sort of certified or a subject matter expert is it lets you 
influence, maybe influence in a more impactful way. Um, so it's not just about promotion. It's really like, no, I can have like a really impactful role in an area that I care about. I mean, let's face it. Uh, you know, some of us went into public service for public service. Right. You know, and and yeah. you know, that's, mm -hmm. we, we right. didn't go into it. Yeah. Oh, for the bottom, the glamour. bottom paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there there is a certain, you know, I've been in public service yeah. since I was in internships and in college and, and yeah. stuff. You know, it's always where I've been. It's always where I've wanted to be. So, you know, it comes down to, you know, it, sometimes it comes down to something as, as simple as that. You picked to be in public service because you wanted to be in public service and you want to be the best you know, public servant that you, you possibly can be. So. Well said, thank you. Yeah, I agree 100%. So I'd like to save the last few minutes of our conversation uh, together to let um, Clyde or Steve jump in. We've heard from others on the subcommittee. Or do you have any questions that you'd like to ask our frontliners here? I'll defer to Clyde, but I'm ready whenever. <laughs> no, I've been actively listening and no, I do not at this time, but it's been a very, 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 very interesting uh, conversation. I agree. So, so I'll concede that in addition to what we've been dropping into the chat, I've been having some side conversations with both Anne and Mark. And it's hard to listen to this and not be thinking about the potential of cooperative purchasing yep. and some of the history there. So if GSA has internal experts, who are developing not only good ties with the industry, but are collecting all of the information necessary to offer the best EV and hybrid vehicles and products to the federal fleet buyers, wouldn't it be excellent if they could either through coordination with NASPO or straight up through cooperative purchasing, be providing some of that knowledge and efficiency to the states? And Obviously, that was the idea behind cooperative purchasing, but there's been pushback for a number of reasons. And you can understand why the private sector doesn't want the federal government setting nationalized prices for commercial product. I mean, again, there's no rocket science here. But given the priority level of some of these things, I don't think it's crazy for us to think about, not necessarily this committee, but the larger committee, seeing if we can open that door. But that was the main thing I was thinking. I really like that idea, Steve. Um, you know, not just in the vehicle space, like, as I understand, like right now, it's just a very limited part of the GSA schedules, uh, a cooperative. I think it's law enforcement emergency and IT, which I think IT is a new one. So that's interesting. Um, but given all the work GSA has been doing to ensure that the products are meeting certain green standards and, and you know, services where you're considering the sustainability requirements, like, I agree 100% with what Steve's saying. It's like one, I think, relatively easy, quick win. It's probably not as easy as I think it is. Is you know expand up the schedules to allow the this the state and locals and other public sector entities to take advantage of all the great work that's already underway in this space. And, and, you know, as Anne says it, the more I think about it, it might be more palatable to the administration rather than opening the door to a massive expansion of cooperative purchasing. What if the only thing that they opened was access to the environmental aisle on the mm -hmm. schedule? Right. Right. I like that environmental aisle. <laughs> Absolutely. So we do have a couple of members of the public here. At this time, I'd like to open it up and ask if we have any questions from the public who are joining us here today. Okay, well, I really want to thank you all for joining us today. This was a terrific session. Speaking for myself, I have learned a lot 
about not just the work that you do, how it connects to the broader uh, acquisition life cycle. This has just been in tremendously informative. So um, I, I hope I speak for the whole committee. This has been a very, very useful session and uh, with gratitude. Thanks. Yeah, very impressive group. Thank you guys so yeah. much. Thank you, glad Thank to be here. Much. Thank you guys. To the rest now, of the go committee. get some vehicles and pro services. <laughs> <laughs> to the rest of the committee, I hope you stay on. We're going to be jam boarding, and All I'm right. going to put in our jam board link here and give you some time uh, to um, pop into. Uh, if you haven't logged into your GSA account, go ahead and do so. We've got a nice chunk of time, 30 minutes, just shy of 30 minutes, 25 where we can brainstorm a bit. So what we're looking for is key discussion points that stuck out for you. This relates specifically to a priority one about making sustainability concerns a core competency. We just really wanna stay focused there. What key discussion points stuck out? And then how should these key points inform our recommendations? two specific areas. I see that Boris and I are the only ones in the jam board. So I'm gonna give you a few seconds before. I'm not seeing the link. To the, yeah. the link, you, didn't, the link oh. didn't go through. Maybe I should hit enter. <laughs> <laughs> it's not enough. I have to execute. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there you are. <laughs> yeah. So now, now we have to remember how to do this. So, oh, yeah, yeah, there's some starting points. Remember on the left, you can add more stickies if you want. I'm gonna, I think we just need a few minutes of quiet time, honestly, to reflect. I'm gonna go back to my notes and pull out some issues here. I think we have a lot to chew on. For sure. I'll share my screen so that we can see it. You can see it on your own computer, but I'll, I'll share that. Kristen, you're muted if you're trying to talk to us. I was talking to myself thinking I kept grabbing somebody else's sticky note, so <laughs> I apologize. I, I, I know it's just me and I'm not the only one, but um, how do I get to the sticky notes? I'm in it. Can you say that again, Clyde? I was trying to ask real lightly, so I wasn't about to hear him, but you, how do I get to the sticky notes? Right, so you're going to go to the far left. If you don't have a blank one right now, you see that arrow with the circle is the one just below it that says sticky note. Click on that. You may need to double click. Yep. Okay. And your sticky note will pop up. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir.
Well, I bet you all I'm taking a look at um, some of the points that stuck out and it's almost like those point, points are potential recommendations. Yeah, there was a little, you know, there is a sort of blurring of the lines, which is fine. I think so too. And and what I'm wondering is a next step, because I thought that we would see more distinct items here. I don't think we do, um, or that we will, and I think that's okay. But maybe we use our little green dots or our dots. Let me make some. Um, and we take some time to look at these and put your dots on, shall we go with which, how many? Three as being the most salient or should we start up higher at five to make this a little bit? Five. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. So you each get five dots start identifying particular areas that you think are really important here. That's some really big dots going on. <laughs> I was trying to get creative <laughs> and create more. <laughs> I think some of these inevitably are going to get grouped. Yeah. But I, I want to get our, our thoughts on relative importance first, and then we can start thinking about grouping them, whether it's going to be something we do today or maybe at, the, um, at our next meeting together. I think this is a good place to pick up. similar. This one's the same, so I'm going to delete it. We have it repeated. Steve, I'm looking at some of these, like not any space to make a decision beyond what's required. That just has, I think, huge implications for the policy subcommittee. I keep adding stickies, new ones.
<laughs> it went behind, Dan. <laughs> I know, I can't get it in front. Here, I'll put it here. sideways. Oh, there, I think it, it just needs to be brought forward. I think I can. Oh, uh, thank you. Let me try that again. No. Yeah. I can do it in Word. Delete that one. Get another dot. That's a bad dot. <laughs> it's a bad dot. It has your face on it. There's, it's no, a, it's a bad sticky. <laughs> I'm try it. Oh, I'll steal it off another sticky. Yeah. No, that would be wrong. Oops. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I did something with this sticky. I'll just put it next to it. You're the best. <laughs> All I right. think it's my sticky that's bad. I like doing this while it's still fresh on our mind. Yeah, I I was reaching a point where it was becoming increasingly clear to me that a lot of the information wasn't getting assembled, at least for me. Yeah. <clears throat> this helps, I think, pull the critical items together. You can all still see my screen, correct? Yeah. Okay. Sticky got moved and we, I think we, did we lose two dots at the bottom? Or were those the ones that were behind us sticky, these guys here? Got it, thank you. to that one. So I'm assuming who still needs time with their dots and stickies. I think we should spend a, at least a couple mm -hmm. of minutes. <laughs> <All right. laughs> who is that? Who's the bad dot person? Oh. <laughs> um, talking about the ones that have multiple dots here that we're seeing. Um, so trainings should focus first at a higher level because the lower levels follow regs and rules. That connects with another item that we see here is the heavy emphasis on compliance, right? Um, mm -hmm. We need quick access ways to obtain relevant sustainability information. That really, it definitely struck a chord for me listening to Michael talk about when he's in the field and he needs access to information, how is he going to get it? Others with multiple dots, I think this gets back to our, our, our universal hope that GSA will 
and the role of this committee will be a lead serve as leadership that states can follow, um, especially if the states uh, need assistance in buying sustainable products. And by the way, I think that could tie into the workforce recommendations if you viewed it within the lens of one of our objectives was to find ways to reduce the friction for the acquisition workforce. And certainly if we can make buying green products, for example, super easy for even state acquisition professionals, like we've, we've even broadened that mandate beyond federal. What I, what I don't know, I'm taking a look at the bottom left corner where these dots are, which they apply to unless it's one and the same. So this group needs to offer training program to certify credentialed <coughs> sustainable purchasers. And then a requirement, the requirements and industry capabilities aren't always in alignment. So I think these are two different things, correct? Yeah, I, I don't did know this. where the dots, what they belong to. Yeah, I've wrote the industry one. I mean, one thing that I walked away with loud and clear is like, you, you can have all, all the top down mandates you want, but if industry can't deliver, what's required, there's no purpose yeah. of training them in it. There was and an, so, yeah. There was another one here about the incentives. Um, frontliners are, um, is that the one? They're constrained by the market supply. And we need yeah, to be I think there were three or four that we could bulk together. Then, because then I later wrote like credentialing has to can have as a component. My takeaway was industry relations, how you reach out to industry, how you learn from industry, how you have that communication. And that's a key, I think, part of being a credentialed sustainability expert, um, because you have to understand the market. And part of the conversation came as a result of the uh, the talk on the performance plans. You know, what what do they control versus what they don't yeah. control? And I think yeah. that 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 was a an insight for me sitting here. It's like, wow, that's true because we have our performance plans. What is mm -hmm. it that we control? What don't we control? And for us to be able to think that through that, I think it's important. And I think it was David Malone in an earlier session that we had said we need to be careful that those that should be held accountable are the ones upstream the ones that are lower down are following the rules that are put in place and and they don't have the discretion to be making uh, certain decisions and yeah he, that's right like we had a couple quality assess, qa personnel here who, yeah. who are cores and i think one of my key takeaways was like credentialing we should make sure we might want to consider um focusing that credentialing earlier in the acquisition life cycle. So program managers, yep. for example. Um, yeah, that's going to be incredibly impactful versus a core. Yeah. So we, I, I, I'm interested in the others, like what what our key takeaways are from this. I, I like to sort of button this up and propose some next steps related to what's happening here with the Jam Board. And I, I think I'd like to iterate with you a little bit. Yeah, I yeah, I have a couple thoughts. At a higher level uh, that we can push back out to the committee, but I'm also looking ahead. Next week, Boris, is an administrative meeting or a leadership meeting? These are the two that I'm confused about. I know that in three weeks time, we have another public meeting. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, we next week we have an administrative meeting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And the week after that will be subcommittee chairs sync up. Yep. Okay. So and next week might be a really good time. And and I won't be there. I'll be out for two weeks. But next week might be a good time to present the, the higher level items that can inform our recommendations. So if it's okay with you, we mm -hmm. can iterate on this and put together a document that can be part of the conversation for next week. Yeah, I think that sounds great. I also like looking at these recommendations and hearing the, the group today. Like, I'd love to hear from some program managers. I, Me I think, too. like at, you a, know, at a higher level. Yeah, yeah. And like, could we have one or two next week just to do 20, 30 minutes, even I'll take 15 minutes just to like validate the role yep. and really understand that one? Because I think that'll that's going to be a key part of what we're recommending. Um, and in the cooperative space, like I think we should explore it. It's it's super interesting, but it's also I know there's a lot of 
Well, it's well, I want to also want to keep us focused because it's not part yeah. of priority one. It's yeah, definitely, that's a good point. Nicole. Definitely Let's important. Hone in on program managers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to do was pro to provide an update with respect to the next public meeting. Anne has been really successful at reaching out to different folks, prim primarily at the local level. Is that right? Or is it yeah, I have yeah, one confirmed um, for uh, at the local level. So the a former chief procurement officer of King County, Washington, who's, uh, who's a local government CPO for 20 plus years in different different cities and counties. So and um, we got confirmation from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So yes. Julia Wolf has received approvals to come and talk with us as well. And so I think the question for us next week at the administrative meeting is whether we uh, have the next public meeting focus on uh, an, another session with uh, with individuals within the acquisition life cycle, or if we want to hear from states and local governments next. All oh, right, right. Because we have three weeks to plan for this. Yeah, so maybe next week we could think about some of the local, the local state and, and program managers, depending on time. All right. Great. Yeah, and, and Nicole, I would say uh, we can definitely pull together another focus group. And uh, so Stephanie and I are working with uh, Nick West uh, oh, nice. to have some different parts of GSA nominate some acquisition professionals just to bring it kind of different group as well. Love that. Yeah, maybe yeah. different categories like IT. Yeah, they bring bring some yeah. different perspectives in. So I and I, I think perhaps for continuity's sake, it may make sense to bring that that additional level in next rather than going from frontliners to state local and then to um and then to um yeah individuals to further up the acquisition life cycle Boris I, it, I, I'm I'm really cognizant of the burden that we put on the GSA staff to help us pull these things together. So you let us know what you think is doable. Yeah, we we uh, we did connect with Nick earlier today about pulling another group. So I'll be reaching out to Nick, and then he's going to talk to some of the leaders in other parts of uh, GSA to pull a sample of, of folks. I did hear you want to talk to some PMs too, and I wonder if that's a separate conversation than the focus group or also part of that? I think it's probably a different category. Okay, right? okay. D depending upon the, where the folks are yeah. that Nick is going to be tapping, that might be earlier on in the acquisition life cycle, correct? Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Is, sorry, Nick is reaching out to individuals for another focus group who are in different categories than vehicles, but right, different categories at GSA, <laughs> right? Fast and also maybe PDS as well. So it's what are they there? Contracting they... officers. There, there will be contracting officers, okay. um, contract specialists, and that okay. those type, and maybe some middle level managers as well. Why don't we just make it one focus group, but we bring into that just a few program managers? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Stephanie, any any thoughts on that? Are you yeah. okay with that, Nicole, or do you want to ask that? Course. No, I mean it's, it's it's what it's what they if if that's what you all would like. Uh, absolutely, I mean we'll just let them know we would like to just have program managers for this focus group. In, in um, addition to, I mean, yeah, I can find a few contracting officers too. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Mix. No just having a mix. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. And a, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie. What a terrific conversation. I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, I, I think leading. it was actually Daryl who's been pushing all along to bring in the contract or the frontliners. He's not here for me to thank him, but I think this was a really, really worthwhile uh, conversation. So um, Anne is going to be taking over for the next couple of weeks, and then I'm going to hop back in in three weeks time. Um, I don't know about operating a jam board, but I can do my best with <laughs> training. <laughs> Stephanie, you want to close us out? I think Boris is going to close us out today. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, it's, it's all good. No, all good. But no, I do appreciate you all. Um, and then, yeah, it just um, it was great, great conversation. I feel like we're definitely in a good, good path here. 
Um, so I'll be following up and I uh, hope all goes well, Nicole, and we'll definitely be in touch. And then Nan will we'll definitely connect as we. Plan yeah, I'm traveling you. next Wednesday, but I think I can step out for two hours. So. Okay. All right. All right. So we'll uh, we'll catch up with you all at the admin meeting then next week. All right, Sounds everybody. great. Have a good all evening. Right. So we'll, we'll call this meeting adjourned. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.